Hi, I'm Filippo Voltaggio with Life Changes, and I'm here having an amazing conversation with Dr. William Tiller. And I'm having fun. <laughs> I'm glad to hear you're having fun. I am so glad. You are sharing information that is so important, and it's wonderful that it's coming from a scientist and and, and not you're not trying to sell us anything no. and you're not trying to preach anything and you're trying to instead say look within and I picture a scientist in a lab or you, you know working I don't picture a scientist meditating what is that meditation to you? We know what it means, or some of us know what it means on the philosophical side or on the religious side. What does it mean to a scientist? What do you actually do? To me, the first time that I meditated, it was like coming home. Mm. My wife felt that she, she had to dust me off to make sure I was still alive. Mm. I loved it so much. So I obviously brought it in from earlier lifetimes. So you sit quietly somehow and well, the, the issue, w my, we, my wife and I started being daily meditators back uh, about 45 years ago. Mm. And um, we started using the Edgar Cayce um, procedure. It was a very simple procedure, sit in a straight back chair, uh, body erect. Um, let's look at two, two, se two ten minute segments. The first segment is close your eyes and uh, focus on either, let's say, a painting or a poem or an affirmation or something. Mm. And every time your mind starts to wander, bring it back. Mm. And every time it wanders, bring it back and you just do that for 10 minutes. So that's, the f that's being a focus part. And then the second part is, again, do the same sort of thing. Pick an affirmation or a poem or a painting or a person or a scene in nature and go into the quiet and be with it and then let it wander and see where it goes and see where it takes you. So you're being open to the universe. Um, maybe every once in a while bring it back to center and start again and if it keeps going down the same path, then perhaps there's something important to you on that path. Mm. But you do that for another 10 minutes. And you do that daily, and you, you first you see the quieting of the noise within yourself, uh, et cetera, and you feel a sense of comfort, you feel connections that you can't really describe. Um, and the more you do it, the more, the easier is it to do it and the more you love doing it. Mm -hmm. So it gives great pleasure. Um, and then I found <coughs> that uh, I began to see that, there, so there's a, there's a the focus aspect and there is being open and nourishing aspect to when I became department chair, I used these techniques. And when I consulted for industry, I used these techniques. I found that <coughs> the industrial one was very interesting. I found that as I worked with these two processes, there's, there appeared to be no in-between state. But if I shifted back and forth fast enough, uh, I was in both states at once kind of thing. Mm. You know, it's just like the eyes. Uh, they have a certain relaxation time. And, and in this particular case, the, it was possible to sense that you were in both places at once. Mm. And so when I was consulting in industry and I had different people coming through the door every half an hour to an hour to describe their technical problem, um, asking for my advice on it, in many cases I was not an, at all an expert in the area where the person worked, but the nourishment part of it, of being open and just sort of loving and caring for the individual who is asking loving the question. Loving and caring. Hmm. You, you get to the place of that kind of trust where you almost join with this individual and I could tap their energy banks, their, their, their knowledge banks kind of thing. They could ask a question and I could respond to them in ways that were benefit to them, sort of using their specific technical insight. Hmm. Um, 
Uh, I found that quite wonderful. Uh, mm. It didn't happen all the time, but it, but when it happened, it was remarkable. Is that what's happening here? Uh, part of it, yes, <laughs> yes, yes. Part of that is happening. Um, the and when I became department chair, of course, you you nourish. One of the thing about about you learn when you become department chair, it's like uh, it's like there's a gr they're a great orchestra, and they all think that they should be the conductor, <laughs> 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 and and so you have to uh, deal with that. But it but it's it's an interesting process. Often uh, students would come in and they would be hesitant about what they wanted to talk about, and they fudged around, and eventually by being open and nourishing to them. It's like a kind of healing. Mm. Um, they would eventually feel comfortable and tell you what they really wanted mm. to ask about. I found uh, that very useful, yeah. So you're, so you're not only discovering the science, you embody it. Yes, yes, absolutely, yeah. Which came first? I started out as a young man as a poet. Um, mm. But not until I, I was interested in, in, in girls and sports. Um, maybe in that order, but, but one of those orders uh, was first. Okay. And it and, uh, was a close call. The, I was a reasonable student in grade school and, and uh, got to high school. I met a teacher, an English and French teacher. And I found, felt inspired by that man. He seemed to see something in me that I didn't see and my parents didn't see. And I wanted to prove him correct, I suppose. Mm. And so I, I, I describe it as he made me want to learn. Mm. And for the first time, I really wanted to learn, to show him how much I appreciated wow. what, what he thought. Uh, I just sort of did it in those days. I didn't think about it. Um, and everything that I touched after that turned to gold. I mean, I became a poet, and my wife fell in love with me as a poet and was really a little unhappy when I turned into a scientist. <laughs> <laughs> Even though the science was maybe going to bring in more money than the poetry? Mm, yeah, well, I mean, that, that was, that's part of the issue. I had to make the decision to whether to be a writer or a scientist. I knew if I became a writer, I could never be a scientist. If I became a scientist, maybe I could become a writer someday. And so you have and been. And so I have been. And so the, I thought it was my idea. Maybe it was, maybe it wasn't. Um, because the unseen has helped to cause things to happen. And uh, uh, certainly my own development uh, between the combination of my wife and the unseen, I've made good progress. <laughs> one, one would think so. Yes. And, and here we are. So now we have this body of information that you have provided us with and 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 before before we talk about that how does that feel by the way to be um the, the only words that are coming you're a paradigm buster that part is true you, you're also called a heretic oh <laughs> the other <laughs> side of it i understand yes um, um. <laughs> and you don't mind that because you know who you are yes uh and that comes I, with I, the territory. I, it comes with the territory. I didn't expect it to. In the early mm. days, I thought if I do world-class science in my normal uh, orthodox area, um, and I do this other on the side, people who respect me so much for the mm. one, one would think that they would maybe mm. say, hey, uh, maybe I should look at this other stuff. Mm. No, it was wrong. It was, a, it was naive assumption on my part. Mm. And that isn't the way it turned out. Uh, they much preferred to think, God, I wonder what's making Tiller sick in this other area. What happened to him? Yeah, what happened he to him? He was such a good scientist. Yes, right, what happened to him? Um, it's, it's just the way it is, that, that you can get so attached to a point of view about nature that you're just sucked in and you can't see mm. uh, that you're in a box. Uh, fortunate that I was able to see that I was in a box, but I found a way to be, be both inside and outside and conduct a dual life with struggle, but it could conduct a dual life and be successful in both areas. And are you able to look at those people and say, those who would consider you a heretic and say, I understand 
where you are, I was there yeah. too, maybe yeah. once. Yeah. No, I do understand now. And I mean, once once you understand, you can't feel badly about the other person. But do you ever get a feeling like, can't you just get it because you're slowing us up here? Um, that's not my decision. You mm. can't take free will away from people. They can't grow if they can't choose. They've got to make choices. And maybe there's no such thing as slowing anybody up because, because it's in the, our own it, process? In, in this other domain, okay, I call the unseen domain, the, the, the domain of the vacuum, mm -hmm. the reference frame that I use for looking at it is, is the frequency domain. No limitations of time or distance. So slowing up doesn't mean a thing. Mm -hmm. In fact, when you, when, you do, right. when you do things with the unseen and you can interact and you try to get something that relates to the time of something moving from potential to actualization, mm. they haven't a clue as to how long it takes because they're working in a domain in which there is no time. Speaking of no time, it seems like this has gone by in no time. And are you able to do one more segment with I us? I can do one more. <laughs> I just, I, I, this is, this is just too hard to pass up, this oh, that's opportunity. Fine. That's fine. So we'll be right back. I'm Filippo Voltaggio talking to Dr. William Tiller.